My name is Marilyn Howe, and I serve on the QP Ontario Executive Board, and I'm the chair of the Racial Justice Committee. And I'm excited to be here today to moderate a discussion on this important and urgent issue. I will be moderating the panel this evening with Sharon Stanley. Sharon is from Local 101 in London and wears many hats at QP, including joining me as a member of the Racial Justice Committee. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling from the indigenous territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishane Bewaki, Mississaugas of the Credit Nation, Mississauga Wendake Nienwentiso. I'd also like to acknowledge that this is the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent. The theme of this decade is people of African descent, recognition, justice, and development. I'll now pass it on to my co-facilitator, Sharon. Thank you very much, Verilyn. This evening, we will be discussing the experiences of Black communities at work, how we can fight anti-Black racism, and how we can create safer space or safer and more inclusive working environments. For this episode, we will be doing a, a live question and answer period around 7.10. Throughout the discussion, please drop any questions you have for our panelists in the Q&A section um, on the Zoom, or if you're joining us on Facebook, in the comment section there. The chat will now be closed so we can focus on the panelists. So to kick off, let's begin by introducing our distinguished guests. Our first panelist is Aubrey Gonzalez. Aubrey is the president of QP Local 2316, representing bargaining unit workers at the Children's Aid Society of Toronto. Aubrey received his BA and BSW from York University and began work at the Children's Aid Society of Toronto as a family service worker. Aubrey is also one of three elected representatives for the Canadian Union of Public Employees Ontario Social Services Workers Coordinating Committee, where they are addressing and raising and resolving the issues concerns and challenges faced by Children's Aid's workers and unions across the province. Our next panelist, Ms. Yolanda McLean. Yolanda is QP Ontario's second vice president, deputy vice president for QP 4400, representing 13,000 Toronto education workers and president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unions of Canada. Verlin. So, and our final panelist that will be joining us is a little later tonight, Dr. Jill Andrew. Dr. Jill Andrew is the MPP for the Ontario Legislature and reportedly any legislature across Canada. She's also the women's issues and heritage and culture critic for the official opposition. She is also a founding member of the Ontario NDP Black Caucus, a first of its kind in Ontario's history. Thank you, Verilyn. And Jill is also the first queer and Black person to sit on the Ontario legislature. So this is, um, we have a great, you know, panel uh, for you today. So let's jump in. Let's start with Aubrey. Aubrey, so nice to see you. Um, you've been working at the Children's Aid Society for 12 years. Now, what has been your experience and your QP local experience of anti-Black racism at 
CAS. Mm. Um, so I've been at the Children's Aid Society of Toronto for 20 years. I started in 2001. I've been the president for 12 years. Okay, and, thank you. And pleasure to serve. Um, my experience is uh, quite unique and different in that um, at a young age in my 20s, I've kind of set my life mission in order to infiltrate a system and change from within. Um, I've always wanted to make the world a better place and, and that was how I figured I would do my part. Um, so I kind of went into the Children's Aid Society knowing what to expect, especially when you're pushing and um, you know, an agent of change for social justice. Um, the expectations of you know, experiencing challenges and struggles expected to achieve goals and successes while at the same time experiencing defeats and setbacks. These have all been part of my experience. Upon entering the Children's Aid Society in 2001 and assigned as a family service worker, um, I can give you numerous accounts in terms of um, how, how race played a factor. Um, you know, where I've seen cases open on Black families or racialized children being brought into care and as a worker questioning the rationale as to why. Um, so in that role, through my experience, I was able to kind of shift how I delivered service. And a few years later, the entire system shifted um, to a more strength-based, family-focused service delivery model, mm -hmm. which is so beneficial and helpful in terms of how we viewed and work with the families, youth and children that we service. Um, I then realized that me doing my part as a worker is only a small part of actually what can be done. And so in order to create effective larger chain, uh, change on a scale greater than just one person, I joined the union. Um, and I was elected as um, in 2002 as the chief steward vice president by 2003, I was on the bargaining team. And so pleased to say that was the first time our local was successful in passing in the collective agreement an employment equity program. That was just a start though. Um, imagine in 2001, when I entered the Children's Aid Society, we couldn't use the word racism there, right? You'd get looks, there'd be denial, defensiveness. And so to push something like this was, was quite groundbreaking. <clears throat> Um, anyways, I was eventually elected as president in 2008 and so proud to be the first non-white person to hold this position and it was like such an honor. I, I kind of joke that my thunder was still who, who beat me to be, you know, the first African elected to the States, but um, I'm so honored to kind of share that um, Thank you. experience. Um, but, but anyways, I, I do want to talk about it's not all fun and glory and rainbows and sun, sunshines. Um, pushing this anti-Black racism initiative, the reality is, in my experience, there has been some challenges and some backlash, and not just from like white workers, um, but also from other racialized workers that feel, as we focus on anti-Black racism, their experience of racism and hardship and oppression is being minimized. And so working alongside many people, uh, only one speck of grain of sand in a beach, right? And so we have an equity committee, we have an equity chair, we have an amazing vice president that works together to, to send this common message, to let people know what the position of the union is and to validate people's experiences and to help them along this journey with us. So it's been a blessed experience for me. And I'm honored. Of course. And, um, yeah, and, and the work that you're doing is so wonderful. And I am, I am so grateful, you know, that you're there and making those changes. And, and so, so tell us, how are you, were you able to address the challenges and the overrepresentation of Black children in care? Um, so let me just start by saying, <clears throat> it's not me. I'm, I'm still just one grain of sand on a beach. So there's many grains of sand that have helped this. And again, I'm just speaking from my experience here in the 2000s, but there were so many strong racialized black workers that, was that came before me 
that got me to where we are today. And there are so many racialized black and, and, and white workers that are continually helping push that envelope further and further. <clears throat> um, but I, I can't remember where it all, all kind of started um, with the overrepresentation. Our agency at some point passed an anti-oppression, anti-racism policy. And through that policy, they struck up a steering committee to ensure the implementation of this policy. And, and being a president, I was co-chair of that committee along with the executive director of the agency. Um, we were both co-chairs to show the importance of this committee and to show our commitment towards anti-oppression, anti-racism. At that time, the agency every single year collects data and coming from neighborhoods that are affected by, you know, the criminal justice system, CIS, education system, when I reviewed that data as a worker, it was exactly what I anticipated it to be, mm -hmm. a higher disproportionate number of black and racialized and people living in poverty, high risk areas. But anyways, at this meeting, they were discussing the data and it was a debate on whether to make it public for the very first time. No agency across the province has shared their data. And of course, as expected, there was some opposition and, and rightfully so. Um, no other agency has released this, so we were setting precedent. The other concerns is the backlash that we would get from the public, you know, are being labeled by the media, targeted by communities. Um, I remember speaking at that, at that meeting, it was a very profound meeting for me because I validated how the public should react. They should be, should be angry. Like for us to be surprised, I think we're missing the boat. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I asked people to focus on the more important point, which was what the public will expect from us after reporting this data. What are the initiatives we're gonna do? What are we gonna do to change this? They will wanna know how this occurred. Um, and so, you know, we needed to focus on that. And so we did as an employer and as a union and as an agency, we put out that data. We took the hits from the, the community as well as from the newspaper and rightfully so. But since that time, we've kind of done a number of things to address it. Um, we've implemented anti-black racism training. So for the first time, and so people are recognizing their implicit bias and yeah. unconscious bias and not aware of that. Um, we've, we've hired um, uh, several anti-black racism supervisors for consultations. And so their role is to review files um, that involve black children and families, and especially if they're coming into care, to make sure that we've exhausted all avenues of kinship, all avenues of service before they're brought into care. And so our agency has done an entire review of this and there's still initiatives that are being thought out and implemented through this process. Um, so it's been a journey and there's a lot to do um, and there's a lot of healing that needs to be done um, towards the community. Um, there's a lot of trust that needs to be built still. And so, you know, I continue to be part of that initiative and work for it. Um, but again, it's, it's not all rainbows and sunshines. There are backlash, right? So one of the things that we've experienced, not just as workers, but as unions across the province, is that defensiveness of being called a racist. You know, mm -hmm. are they saying because we bring in, you know, overrepresentation of black children and families involvement, are we racists? And it's that bad word rather than, you know, people taking the time to understand and learn what that means um, and, and the way we do our work. So that's been some of our journey. Well, hey, you know, that one sand, one grain in the middle, mm -hmm. trust me, you have branched out and you're just doing some awesome, awesome work. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've got another question for you. Okay, all right. So Aubrey, can you tell us about your push for employment equity and what role that plays in the services you deliver? Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's definitely not my push. I, I, I refuse to take much of the credit because there's been so many people involved before me and during my time and after me. Um, so again, this has been a journey for us. Um, in, 
in the early 2000s when I first came on, it was stark and obvious, but nobody said anything. And so as chief steward in, in the meetings with human resources, I, I, I raised that in terms of the employment equity, how many racialized staff do we have uh, on the floor in terms of workers, and then especially the disproportionate numbers and lack of racialized management staff. Um, the way I did it was to plan and strategize and be tactful about it, um, to make sure that people don't find me threatening, um, nor am I throwing accusations to make them defensive. I started identifying common goals. So our common goal is to have a diverse workforce. Yes, so let's work towards that. So it started as um, the stewards, so the, so many people were involved. The stewards went out in every department, in every branch, and did a, a visual eyeball kind of survey in terms of identifying racialized people and managers. Um, I totally know that's not appropriate or acceptable, but it was a start. And so bringing that survey to HR, they threw it out the window because obviously it's, it was done by eyeball. Nobody was self-identifying. And I expected that to happen because that then had... Are, that then provided us leverage for the employer to do one on their own. If they're not trusting ours, I don't trust ours either. So why don't we do one together? And so it was the first time the employer did a, a census survey for our agency. And then once that was completed, no one was able to question that because it was all done you know, appropriately and with time. Anyways, from that, we continue to build our employment equity language in the collective agreement. In, in 2003, it just started with a simple, you know, when we're advertising jobs, we should be looking at um, cultural, cultural newspapers and magazines to make sure we're getting into those communities. Um, our employment equity language continued to grow and grow until 2008 when it was time and we had a majority of our workers supporting it we put forward a proposal that outlined actually what the employment equity program, which we deem as like equitable hiring mm -hmm. looks like. And so the employer spent the past couple of years working with the Human Rights Commission, because as you know, these programs are not a guarantee. Anybody can overturn them. And to be honest with you, the majority of people that are against these programs are often unions because they impact their workforce so much. I didn't even know that until mentioned by the Human Rights uh, Commission. Um, but anyways, we are at a point now where we're actually meeting with management. I, in fact, ironically, I have a meeting tomorrow to talk about how to implement this in our workplace. So just to let you know, since this uh, employment equity language is put, put in the collective agreement, management, just at the beginning of the year, has applied their employment equity program to management positions. Mm -hmm. So now we're meeting tomorrow to identify the implementation of how that will work for bargaining unit positions. So again, I am so blessed to be here at this point in time in history, in the history making of our agency. Thank you for sharing your experiences and the challenges you, and the challenges you and others face up Thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. So moving on, you're welcome. Moving on to our next panelist, Yolanda McLean. Yolanda, you have dedicated much of your life to the labor movement. And I have seen firsthand the work you, myself, and members of QP have done to create a more inclusive union and more equitable work environments. So Yolanda, please tell us about QP Ontario's anti-racism organizational action plan and a few ways locals can integrate this work into their union. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sister V, because that's what we call you. When you tell folks we've known each other for a long time, when I call you Sister V, it's a very long time. <laughs> and I'm so honored to do this work alongside with you. And uh, actually, I'm proud of uh, you as my femter. And I thank you for um, doing the work that you do to help me get to where I am today. So thank you. And thanks everyone for having me on the panel today. You know, we began this work because we heard directly from our members uh, at a convention. 
And I have to be honest, you know, I feel right now, I, I don't know, what do they say? Like goosebumps, mm -hmm. you know, like the hairs are standing on your arms like, or whatever, because I'm on a panel with Sister V and Sharon and Aubrey, who uh, joined me in this historical moment that I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, at a convention uh, for almost an hour, delegate after delegate after delegate, they came to the microphones and they told us about experiencing racism and they reminded us of the bitter reality that the leadership of QP Ontario uh, did not look like them. And in many ways, our locals in leadership didn't look like them. And they didn't represent the makeup of our membership as a whole. QP Ontario Anti-Racism Organizational Action Plan that Marilyn just asked me about. And if you're okay, can I just say AROP for short? Cause it's just easier. Uh, our AROP committee was established in uh, 2018 with a goal to address the systemic underrepresentation and exclusion of black, racialized and indigenous members in our union. And this was a historical moment in our time, a historical moment like no other union in this country. And I say this all the time. I always say, uh, you know, I wanna be able to tell my children's children, children, like in 2018 and then 2020, we were historical. Uh, we made historical moves uh, in moving our QP agenda forward in a positive way to include racialized indigenous uh, black workers into leadership roles. You know, the committee as it stands now is made up of QP Ontario officers black, indigenous and racialized members and staff who've begun the critical work of addressing racism in our union. But this is meant to developing a plan to ensure that representation and participation happened at all of our conventions, our conferences and our locals and advocating for a creation of leadership training for underrepresented members. You know, we've been working closely with union development. Thank you so much in our union education department to ensure that all of the workshops uh, that we've had, they incorporate an anti-racism principle and more. And as we speak now today, uh, those of us on the panel, some of us on the panel, uh, this is our third Zoom today because we actually had another Zoom uh, where we are um, bringing in other members uh, from locals to be a part of the committee because it's the members who brought the issues forward. You know, this work is uh, more critical than ever. And uh, we have to talk about COVID-19 because that pandemic has only exposed the deep inequity in all corners of our society. And AROP's clear goal that was passed by our members at two Ontario conventions uh, will help us move forward. And they were to ensure that QP Ontario is a leader in the anti-racism movement by creating an organization that removes barriers that encourages the QP national structures and local unions in the region to do the same and to ensure that QP in Ontario is safe and open for every member's activism and participation. And an organization that is better able to oppose all forms of racism, including specifically anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism in all of our communities. You know, but uh, I do have to say that Having this work only done by QP Ontario at a provincial level is not the answer. You know, we're beginning to do this work here at the provincial level and I think it's really good because of course convention, at convention, uh, our members really had proven that they wanted to make a difference. But I have to say that the goal is to also use this as an example for our local unions to follow, to bring this work in removing barriers and making uh, our union more representative our, of our members at the local level. Because in CUPE, we know that there's power in our union and the provincial level and at the local level. And that members primarily experience our union at the local level. That's what they can relate to. That's where they don't see themselves reflected, starting from there. And uh, as most of us know, local autonomy means that we can't force our locals to do this work. And some folks think that's a bad thing, but I actually think that that's a good thing uh, because, you know, we build a culture where this work is not just something that we talk about and we put on paper and we sort of have meetings about, but it actually becomes a part of the work that we do. And uh, where there are supports 
and where we can lead by example and do good work, then hopefully others will follow and locals will also follow us when they see the example. I think that this is more powerful. Thank you, Yolanda, for sharing some ways organizations and union locals can take action on anti-Black racism. Next, we'd like to ask you to boldly imagine workplaces that nurture and celebrate Black lives. What would a workplace of anti-Black racism actually look and feel like? Wow. Wow. Loaded question, but very interesting question. <laughs> I mean, it is really hard to answer because I know what I feel and I know what I would like. I know the experience that we had at convention and I know what I can see in the future. Uh, and all those things are really positive. But, you know, anti-Black racism is so deeply ingrained in ways that are even unconscious to all of us in a way. And I think it often gets captured by those that say, like, um, in our workplaces, they say, well, these are just the, the way things are done, or we say these things all the time, or I don't know why Black people just don't uh, go to meetings or run or get active uh, for the union, because the door is open, we let them in, but they just don't come. I mean, those are some things that we're, are become challenging for us. It's what we've discovered, um, why having this AROP committee and the AROP process is so important because it's made us stop and really look at the way that we are doing things. Are we really including everybody at the table? You know, we have made a number of changes that reduce uh, barriers as a result, thanks to the AROP committee at the provincial level. And in answering this question, I'm thinking about QP, uh, where we have different sectors uh, with different cultures and different challenges based on those cultures. Um, but as you know, I'm also the president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists Ontario chapter. And it also, I also have to think about um, different unions because I represent like public and the private sector and a huge number of different workplace cultures and rules that governs that work. So uh, the question is a lot to consider, but in general terms, I guess, uh, even with all the challenges and differences of culture and location, between the sectors and the public and the private. Um, it makes sense to imagine workplaces free of anti-Black racism and sexism and ableism and all forms of discrimination because the very act of imagining it makes it so real. And there is some basic principles that we, uh, that we have to work on to help us get there. It doesn't happen overnight. That's why I talk about AROP as being a plan and not a beginning, a middle end, and a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a start date and a finish date, but continuing to continually to grow in the work that we're doing. Because you know, to fight to, to end systemic racism, we need to lead from the top, with all members of our union included. Uh, I think as we undertake this work, we recognize that systemic racism uh, that we're now dealing with in our dialogue, it's not new. Um, and racism is not new to Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. And in this movement, at this time, the amount of violence that has increased with the impact of COVID-19 has absolutely disproportionately impacted Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities. And, you know, this is all happening because of the institutional racism and sexism. Employers govern how we care about people in this country. And I think now is a time more than ever, you know, we talk about like since George Floyd and, and on now, it's more, it's now is a time to talk and speak and show up for all of our workers. I mean, now, I think now is a time to survey the demographics of our workplaces. I like what Aubrey said. I think now is a time to establish clear goals. Um, now is the time to use an intersectional analysis to understand the experience of workers. Uh, I think now is a time to investigate the efforts and contributions of black workers, you know, is your, is the work that you're doing in your workplace directly connected to the internal culture? Um, I think now is a time to put resources, we talk about this all the time, into enhancing leadership roles in the lives of black workers. For example, you know, you can commit to a process that centers in anti-racism hiring facilitators that look like us, uh, that represent the communities for a long-term program that develops and retains real work for those groups. 
and uh, set si uh, um, significant resources aside. Uh, we talk about resources, we talk about training, but we have to also talk about those resources um, that, we act, that we do need. Um, so it helps people of all races and all genders to combat racist behavior. I think this is like a combination of things that we need to do because I imagine the leadership that reflects the diversity of our communities and wow, if we can just implement some of those things, I think then leaders could recognize that anti-Black racism, you know, has not just been alive and well for over 400 years, but you know, we all, with these kinds of implementations, we can all come together to find ways to make a positive change. Uh, unions, we're on the forefront of this work. And uh, unions and communities, you know, like CBTU and and uh, and uh, QP, I think organizes organizations like this. We're all linked, and I imagine a world where where we can hear more Black voices and we can believe in more Black voices. And leaders need not to let this moment pass by with no meaningful change. Uh, can we imagine a workplace that opens doors that creates space for Black workers? for indigenous workers, for racialized workers. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can imagine a better day. And this is not about conquering and dividing and separating. This is about us working together so that everyone has a seat at the table. And this is about building us all up for a better society for generations to come. That's absolutely wonderful to hear. Uh, there's so much work being put into this. And I mean, you've been instrumental in uh, getting us truly motivated to push the AROP plan. Yes, and it is an ongoing, you know, kind of uh, process because things do change, you know, as we move along. So thank you very much, Alanda, for all the work that you do. And finally, we have, uh, um, not quite, uh, sure if um, Jill is with us, um, but what we will do, we will go to some Q&A and um, get some of your questions answered. So can we ask, uh, do we have any questions, Kimberly? Hi, yes, we do have some questions in the Q&A on Zoom. Uh, so I will read, um, I'll read two questions to start. Uh, two questions came in from Robert, Robert Walker. Thanks for your questions, Robert. Uh, Robert is asking, uh, since the Ontario QP Convention is coming up, uh, will there be workshops on anti-Black racism and racism against other people of color? And Robert is also asking a question around the federal government's designation of some groups as terrorist groups through legislation and some concerns that uh, folks have flagged that this may potentially um, boomerang against uh, racialized and other minority groups and how can QP respond to this? So those are two questions from Robert. I'm not sure if anyone wants to respond. And I think maybe Jill, when Jill arrives, speaking to the labeling of groups mm -hmm. as hate groups, terrorists might be a good question for Jill. So we can start yeah. uh, by asking who would answer that question, and then I would uh, I will check in uh, with um, uh, Dr. Andrews. I mean, I think I can help answer the question about convention. Um, I, I know that um, so the webisode is like you know labor and community, and everybody's on it. But for those that are um, are in QP, there is an, an opportunity for for you to, uh, from March the first to the fourth uh, to uh, join the human rights conference uh, that the national is putting on, which is a very um, like anti-racism uh, focused. They'll be um, presenting a document uh, talking about the anti-racism strategy at the national level, which is good. That's why I wanted to answer because I wanted us to know that like this work can only be done yes. at all levels of the organization. It just can't stay in one place or it doesn't work, which I think uh, some unions it's not like it doesn't, it's not working as well for them because it, they, it just stops at a place, but everybody's involved in our process, which helps to make the difference. Um, and for QP Ontario, we don't have specific workshops in particular that we will be presenting at our convention per se, uh, but we will be integrating anti-racism, uh, our work, 
and our panels and our resolutions uh, at the convention for sure. Hopefully you can come and be a part of that. And I want you to also know that we are have already started to uh, um, deliver workshops like challenging racism in the workplace. Uh, and those workshops are free to our members. You just have to sign on, find a spot. Uh, you don't have to be from Ontario in particular to take any of them. You can, as long as you sign on and you get on in the right, right time zone, uh, you can take any of them. And QP National is working really hard in um, developing and writing like anti-racism 101, 201, 301. So there's so many opportunities for us to actually do this work and do good work that not that after you take these workshops and after we learn through this process, but you will also be able to go back to your workplaces and implement it. And that's the base where we have to start from. That is great. Thank you so much for that information. And if we can defer the second piece, because we do have a very, very busy woman with us tonight. And I will go forward and just welcome Dr. Jill Andrew. Um, I mean, it's just great uh, to have uh, to have you here. Uh, Sharon, you, how are you? I am well, and how are you doing? I, I am good. I am standing. I am good. I am alive. I am healthy. Sorry. I thought that better not be the 7.30 because you're way too early. I'm not answering. <laughs> My so apologies about that. Let me let me uh, continue to introduce you by saying, you know, you were elected in the Ontario legislature in 2018 with the Ontario NDP. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are very, you're the first uh, queer uh, black woman in the legislature oh. in Ontario and reportedly in all of Canada. So in, that, in, in, in having said that, mm -hmm. what were some challenges that you faced in Queen's Park? And Oh, and, go ahead, sorry, and, Sharon. Okay, anyway, um, you're processing, that's great. Uh, and what are some difficulties um, or differences um, that you've noticed in the way uh, that basically you were treated in comparison to other elected uh, representation? Thank you very much for that question, Sharon. Uh, well, first of all, um, I want to say a big, big, big hello to everybody here. You know, I want to also thank you all for your work. Um, I want to also emphasize that I am standing uh, proudly uh, by your side, behind you, next to you, wherever you need me to be, uh, because now more than ever, we need to fight for workers' rights. Uh, we need to fight for our frontline healthcare workers. We got to fight for our education folks, our folks in the it, it, working at the municipal level. We have to fight, you know, for our for our for our educators, as I mentioned, PSWs, essential workers, cashiers, you name it. Because what we have on our hands with this unprecedented pandemic, we have a moment in history where people have died, and I frankly believe that they have died unnecessarily. And today in the legislature, and I just literally flew in, my hands are still cold. You know, we were all standing, fighting, advocating for paid sick days. And I, I want to make it clear that paid sick days are not only about, you know, ensuring that workers can stay home, uh, when they are sick, take care of them as their selves, their children, their loved ones. Uh, not only does paid sick days benefit our economy, you know, we have small businesses saying paid sick days. <laughs> you know, we have former, you know, PC government leaders saying paid sick days. You know, we have, what's his name, uh, Dr. Uh, Williams saying paid sick days. Yeah, I support it, right? And we have a premier who's not supporting this uh, and a minister of labor. But, but let's make no mistake that we know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted Black people, Black women, Indigenous communities, and, and other racialized communities. So in my opinion, and I'm certain you know, our friends at QP share the same opinion here. You know, when, when the government doesn't take the opportunity 
to create a law that is going to help communities, especially those that have been disproportionate, disproportionately impacted by this pandemic, this sends a very loud message, it should, to every single one of us across this province. The Premier does not respect Black lives. The Premier does not respect racialized lives. And we already know how they feel about Indigenous lives. Because we know that there are Indigenous communities going on almost their third decade on water boil advisories in Ontario, right? So paid sick days is also a, a tool to address anti-Black racism in Ontario, is what I'm trying to say. Um, paid sick days is about leveling the playing field. It's an equity, it's a, it's a response to the injustice of having essential workers crammed on packed buses where they cannot get to work safely, you know, where they cannot socially distance. These are not just health and safety issues. These are not only workplace issues, but these are equity issues. And I say all of that, and then I come back to your question of how have I experienced Queens Park? I am a very animated speaker. <laughs> I use my hands a lot. I take up space, you know? And as a black woman, as a queer woman, as a dark brown skin woman, as a fat woman, as any woman you wanna call me in my embodiment, when I stand up and speak in the legislature, not a lot of people see it on the other side as passion. They don't see it as urgency because I am standing and talking urgently you know, whether it's about constituents, you know, who are facing evictions, whether it's about that PSW who has told me that she's being told she's got to use her PPE in the one room with the person that's COVID positive and then the next room with the person that's COVID negative, right? Whether it's an educator or an education worker, and I got to say ECEs, CYWs, education assistants, education workers are often racialized as well. When I stand in the house, I'm not only standing with my angst, <laughs> I'm standing with the angst of the folks who put me there in St. Paul's here, but I'm also standing with the angst of, you know, communities that I subscribe to across Toronto, you know? I'm standing with the angst of my ancestors as well, who are probably shocked and some of them rolling in their grave to see that we're still in the 21st century, having to scratch our heads about how we're gonna address anti-Black racism in Ontario, right? There have been many moments when my presentation at Queen's Park has been read as rude, as throwing shade or tone, you know, um, as being aggressive versus assertive, you know, you see their body language, oh, you know, when I speak sometimes. And while I believe that, that their goal is to try to silence me or to maybe box me into some sort of respectability politics around how I should present, you know, maybe I should smile more, maybe I should have a quieter voice, right? It's not going to stop who I am and how I bring myself to the legislature, you know? So rather than speak about what I know is coded language, coded language that props up racism against black women, uh, that props up sexism or misogynoir as one may call it, I'm not even going to focus on me as an individual, you know? We can look at this as a bigger crisis that's happening in Ontario. If I'm a Black MPP standing in the, in the legislature and folks think that I'm <laughs> intimidating or I'm aggressive or I'm a big mouth or loud or oh, she's throwing tone or she's rude, right? 
How are MPPs responding to the black women and black people and racialized folks who are calling their phones and emailing them and they're angry and they're rightfully so. They should be angry because you have to be angry when your child is racially profiled or carded on the streets of Ontario because that law still stands in Ontario because the previous liberal government for 15 years, you know, whatever show ponies that they can do at Carabana and various other tokenistic multiculturalism events didn't think that addressing carding and anti and racial profiling was significant enough, right? Our constituents have a right to be angry. They have a right to yell and scream. They have a right to have uh, their eyes wide open and to speak with their hands. And if I'm being looked at as rude or attitudinal, <laughs> right? How are constituents across Ontario being treated by some of their MPPs? And that's something I think about a lot, you know? We know that we have an anti-racism directorate that is a, a skeleton. You know, it's, it's at last, at, at the last account, if I'm not mistaken, the anti-racism directorate had a budget line of about $1,000. So I don't know how much anti, how much anti-black racism, I don't know how much, you know, we can address anti-Semitism. I don't know how much we can address Islamophobia in our province when the anti-racism directorate isn't properly funded, properly resourced, you know? What we also know about the Human Rights Tribunal even, and, and this, is, this may be stepping a little bit out of, you know, the COVID conversation of the moment, but we have to ensure that all of these equity issues <laughs> Yes. remain front and center in the COVID conversation because the same way the government, the same way Ford has used COVID as a guise to try to, you know, ruin the environment, you know, abusing their, their minister zoning orders, you know, putting up developments, not caring about Greenland farmers, this, that, and the other. It's the same insidious way that COVID has also created an opportunity for them to slide through other things. So when we see that the Human Rights Tribunal, you know, a, a place that's supposed to be a safe space where, you know, people, you know, many of whom are Black, you know, many of whom may be reporting issues of anti-Black racism, you know, in, in, in their school boards, for instance, or, or in their public sector workplaces, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying, yes. are, are going to the tribunal but not met with the resources to assist them, you know? When, when you hear of adjudicators going from numbers like 22 or something like that, down to 11, down to potentially three or so within February, right? When you peel the onion even further and see that many of these appointees have direct ties with the conservative government, and even further, because, you know, for all due respect, people have the right to have their political opinions, whatever their political opinions are. But if you're a human rights adjudicator and you don't have any human rights experience, you know, that's a concern. That's a concern, right? So when we don't have a human rights tribunal that's functioning properly, what we end up having are a backlog of cases, you know? We have folks who may become disenfranchised and frustrated because remember, that's how systemic discrimination works. That's how white supremacy wins. That's how every type of racism and phobia wins is the idea is to beat you down mentally, if not physically as well, and economically mm -hmm. to the point where you just say, ah, Lord, you know what? Ah, right. I give up, right? We see the same thing happening over at the landlord and tenants board, all right? When we also know that BIPOC communities experience more evictions, you know, experience more, you know, intimidation and, and you know, unfair treatment 
from property management, landlords, whatnot, right? When you can't get the help you need from the landlord and tenants board, because Doug Ford has decidedly not filled vacancies in the landlord and tenants board, so that hearings could happen on time, you know? Once again, we're met with a situation where you have many renters. We have about 67% renters here in St. Paul's, right? And I'm thinking of certain communities right now, you know, Oakwood and Vaughn, uh, Winona, you know, our friends over at 100 Vaughn Road, you know, folks on Tychester, Heath, whatnot, right? You know, residents on Eglinton West in Little Jamaica. I'm thinking about the folks who, you know, are trying to be good tenants. They are good tenants, you know? But the toilet's not working, you know? Or, you know, um, the water is cut off. The cold water is cut off for several months, as was the case last spring for the folks at 100 Vaughn Road, right? Or, or the, the management is not responding to your emails, your concerns, you know? Yeah. Or maybe you were so downtrot last year that you agreed to sign a, a rent repayment arrangement, right? Which as we know from Ford government's bill 184, you know, was basically the red carpet to allow folks to evict their residents even faster once they signed a repayment plan, right? All of these things don't happen by accident, right? They happen to further marginalized folks who are already feeling the squeeze, you know? So I'm a renter, I'm maybe a single parent, I am an essential worker, I'm not feeling well, but I can afford childcare because Ontario doesn't have a childcare plan. There's no strategy during the pandemic of all times. So I am in a situation, rock in a hard place, right? Do I go to work? Sick, it might be COVID. Or do I stay at home and lose several days of pay? There's a lot of- What, pardon? I'm sorry, there, there is, um, you know, there's a lot of hardships. You yes, know, yes. And I wanted to get to yes. you know, that piece with the hardship, you know, and you did already address uh, the uh, the mistreatment and the misogynistic mm -hmm, way, mm -hmm. uh, the um, homophobia, uh, you know, within, you know, your workplace. Um, you know, you have indicated to us that the government has failed, more or less, the Black Absolutely. community. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. really and truly at this particular point, because I'm being also mindful of time. Um, Sorry. No, that is okay. <laughs> the information was so pissed incredible. about today at the legislature. <laughs> it was incredible. You're still on fire, you know. So, but but um, what could or should you know the government uh, be doing? You know, if you can, if you can wrap it up with that piece. Yes, yes. Well, first and foremost, we need to legislate paid sick days. In my opinion, um, that will impact every Ontarian worker. Um, that will benefit um, BIPOC communities, that will especially benefit women, Black women, quite frankly, uh, who, in my opinion, are at the forefront of this pandemic, uh, whether they are helping their communities as essential workers, whether they are working for us in public transit, whether they are our educators or education workers, what have you. That is my stance, right? What else we need to do? We need to ensure even that injured workers, you know, right now during COVID-19, you know, who are also feeling, feeling an additional squeeze, have the supports they need. You know, we need to see presumptive language. We need to know that under no circumstance is a worker going to lose their home during this time, you know? We need an eviction ban, for goodness sakes. You know, our, our colleague over in Toronto Centre is fighting for this, as, is all, as are all of us, you know. We need an eviction ban so that nobody loses their home, nobody loses their small business during this time. 
Uh, we need a fully funded anti-racism directorate. You know, we must, we must, we must ban racial profiling and carding. And I know that these are on top of mind on everyone's agenda, but they have to be top of mind because the reality is we are still walking black. Mm -hmm. We are still shopping, doing groceries while black. We are still getting into our cars and onto the trains and the subways while black. So COVID or not, black lives, black bodies are still very much under attack in this province and frankly across the globe. So we can't, we can't not address that. You know, we need a livable wage for goodness sakes. You know, there, there are many pieces that I could speak to. We need a provincial strategy that addresses anti-black racism, you know, across all of our school boards. That's a very important piece because guess what? Virtual learning, quote unquote, it's working for some, but we have to also address the digital divide, the digital economic inequities mm -hmm. of those who have internet, don't have a data plan, right? Who can't afford extra tutoring for little Johnny and little Molly on Saturday, right? These are points that we have to address, no, you thank know? You so so thank you. I mean, there, there's so much more that I could say, but I think that that is a bit for today. Yeah, you've highlighted yeah. many, many great points, totally. Um, you know, emphasizing the disproportionate, you know, uh, impacts, you know, on uh, BIPOC communities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I will, uh, I will have um, Ms. V now further, you know, address uh, uh, the rest of the discussion, because we do have some people that would like to ask some questions. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Jill Andrew. Thank um, you. Now we will now move on to our next segment. We're going to move into our audience question and answer period. If you have any questions for any or all of our panelists, please drop them in the Q&A section on Zoom or on the Facebook comment section. Kimberly, are there any questions for our live audience? Yes, thank you. We do have a few questions. Um, I apologize in advance to those who may not get their questions answered. I know we are running short on time. And there are a couple of people who submitted multiple questions. So we, we're going to try to take at least one, but no guarantees. Apologies in advance. So given that um, there are majority QP members on this panel, I pulled in a couple of questions that speak to QP uh, workplaces. Uh, one person is asking a question around the pros and cons of having a joint employer, joint union committee focused on anti-Black racism. Uh, like, what are the pros and cons of doing this with the employer? Should the union still create its own committee? Would that be seen as duplicating work? So that's one question. Um, another question that we have um, is around whether or not workplaces should be surveying and publicizing its workforce demographics? Like how can we go about doing this without making people feel centered or singled out in the workplace, especially if it's a workplace where they're already highly visible? Um, and then thirdly, there's a question from another member asking, like what can union stewards do when management seems to be ignoring the fact that supervisors are treating black staff differently from white support staff. Um, so those are three questions. I hope you're taking notes. I just wanna read them all so that you can address them as needed. There's another question around um, hmm, how, it's a question we get in a lot of these webisodes. It's like, what can folks who are not black, how can they support the movement? What role do they play? And uh, how do you do this work when you face opposition from your local um, and in particularly white members in your local? Hmm. So, so Kim, would any of the panelists uh, like to answer these questions? How about the first one regarding uh, union management? Would it be beneficial to have you know, a union management group work on anti-black racism? Does anyone want to take that on? 
Aubrey, go ahead. I can share what we've done. Um, so it's a very important question and we've actually processed it with our local. Um, so the first thing I would say is there's nothing preventing any local from setting up their own equity committee meeting, like committee, and still having a joint committee with management. Um, it doesn't matter if the work is being duplicated, um, even if it's the same messaging going out, like there's gonna be a number of factors and, and people involved that's gonna need to get the um, communication out there and the messaging out there. So the way we do it is we have a joint committee with management and we have a number of um, union people on there. We then have our equity committee within the, the union and we elect the people who are going to sit on that union management committee. Um, any information from that committee, we bring back to our union equity committee because the more heads and voices and ears and, and eyes you have working together, the more insight you get. So that's also the focus. The, the equity committee that we have in our union has mandates. So we ensure that we check barriers within our union. We ensure the, another mandate, we, we ensure that the implementation of the AOAR policy is, is being conducted in employment equity. So it's, it's just to make sure that there are specific mandates for the union equity committee, along with the joint union management committee. And there can be some overlap sharing of goals and, and, and pieces. Um, I, would you like me to answer? I can- You can, you can, yeah. Continue, okay. Yeah, exactly. I, I, uh, yeah, I'll just, uh, cause there were so many questions. I just sort of now remember, uh, sorry, one or two out of the mm -hmm. lot. So uh, then later on, I guess you could just keep telling about the rest of it. Okay. Um, short memory, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, that was interesting when folks like we're in our locals and we are uh, experiencing some really difficult times. I think that I talked about before, um, and we have a lot of members that are afraid uh, to actually start to do this work because they are afraid of what could happen in their workplace. Um, I can tell you a really short, really really short story that uh, a story that I heard of, but we didn't experience the story. Like I wasn't there for it. Um, you know, years ago, uh, the Canadian Labour Congress and the Ontario Federation of Labour didn't see themselves reflected, our members didn't see themselves reflected at the leadership uh, position either. Uh, like they looked up on the stage and no one looked like them. And, um, you know, at first they were also afraid to come forward and afraid to do something. And uh, in, a, in someone's like hotel room in the corner, in the side, in the back, in the underground, like, you know, in someone's basement, people huddled and had discussions and strategized and came up with a plan uh, to help uh, each other understand what folks were going through mm -hmm. and to find a way to uh, have their voices being heard. And together as a group of folks, they started a campaign called one, one plus one equals two. And that was uh, the one plus one equals two was a campaign so that what, they would have one racialized and one uh, black worker on the executive board, that it would be um, uh, put into the, uh, it would be a resolution, a constitutional amendment that will help make a difference so they would see themselves reflected. Um, it took years, years. Now, remember, I wasn't there, I'm just telling a story that I heard, <laughs> uh, 10 years to get those two seats. And, but they didn't stop and they persist and they work together. And uh, they continued to talk, you know, uh, of course, I'm sure in those days they didn't have phones and WhatsApp. I'm sure they met in uh, coffee shops <laughs> and at people's houses and in their kitchens uh, to actually strategize to have those kinds of conversations. It's difficult. It's not gonna be easy. We do have to find ways to talk to each other and, and find ways to actually break uh, the ceiling uh, to say, make the difference. But I do have to say, but we can't do this alone because we also need our allies, which was another question. That's and we talk about like, what, how do allies help us and how do, how do, what can allies do to be a part of the solution and not the problem? Mm. Um, we, have, we need their voices. We need them there with us at the table. We need them on our side and not just to say, oh yeah, you guys can do this. Don't worry, I, I got your back. You always got our back. But are you really there with us when it comes time 
to like go to a convention or go to your employer or go to, you know, go around to the local and talk to other members about how you can make, make a difference and make change. Because what I do remember part of the story that I wasn't there, but I know the story, <laughs> um, a bunch of uh, uh, folks, black racialized and indigenous uh, members and a lot of allies, white allies, uh, went to convention and wore their uh, buttons saying one plus one equals two, went to the front of the convention floor and demanded uh, for a seat at the table. And when they were not acknowledged, then they left the convention and the allies showed, they didn't just talk, they didn't just have their back, they showed uh, uh, the appreciation that they that they know that if they stand together with everyone else, that we can all make a difference together. That we're not leaving anybody behind, and uh, that's uh, in a nutshell how we got there. And I think that locals have the opportunity to do that kind of work now. Um, you know, to work together. And allyship is not just having your back, but what can you really do in the public eye to show your support to help make the difference. And thank you so much for pulling those two together and showing how it, um, important it is to be able to utilize, uh, you know, the allyship to, to move things uh, uh, forward. And I think that Rosemary Brown has this ama two amazing quotes, because I say it all the time. So, you know, I can't leave a panel, like I can't leave without saying it, because I say these two quotes everywhere I go, because I love them. One is like, until all of us have made it, none of us have made it, is one of them. And the other one is we must open doors and we must see to it that we re they remain open so that others can pass through. Awesome. I think those are my two key ones when I think about those questions. Now, thank you so much for sharing, Yolanda. Verilyn? We did say that we were going to try and get to questions yeah. and, and uh, Kimberly did apologize. Uh, we are a little short on time and okay. we, we truly hope that everyone enjoyed the information that they have received. Um, you know, at some point, I'm sure we will address some of these questions that are here. I mean, we see them in the chat. We will keep them. You know, uh, we are not ignoring uh, anyone, but we have to really try and work within our time frame. So I will leave it to you, Miss. Uh, uh, v, as we say, the sister V. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Aubrey, Yolanda, and Jill for joining myself and Sharon tonight for QP Connects. It's been so inspiring listening and learning from all of you. Also, thank you to Angie for providing us with ASL, interpretation to make our websites Webly sold more accessible. Also to the team of folks that were instrumental in delivering support to this webisode. Daniel, Elise, Rory, Liam, Kimberly, and Dawn for their contribution. And lastly, thank you to our live audience for joining us. During Black History Month, to learn about anti-Black racism in the workplace and how you can take action. Stay tuned for the next QP Connects webisode next month. And that is a great wrap and one uh, a person that we uh, need to also thank at the ASL is that um, we have Gabriel and we thank you for being with us as well. And to close off, to paraphrase, I mean, uh, Ms. Yolanda gave some uh, great uh, quotes, but I will paraphrase Maya Angelou. So tonight for folks, people will remember what you did. People will remember, will not remember what you said, but people will remember how you made them feel. So I hope you were inspired and empowered by uh, this webisode. Uh, we thank everyone again for being here. Be good to one another and be safe. Ms. Berlin? Thank you, Sharon. So, and I'll also close by saying what Sharon just said. Be good to one another and be safe. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>